But what were you going to say? Were we going to talk about something? Today? Well, you're talking about Vegemite, and I was going to talk about the mighty new WWE series on A&E. There's a few of them, and you had me watch a couple of them. See, now you ask me to watch these off-brand modern wrestling shows with this bullshit, and I tell you, I said, let's watch the good stuff about the stars. You so I, you did is, to me what people, you called me up and you said, you have to watch it. There is something that will infuriate you. <laughs> you must watch it. <laughs> Uh, well, not on the, not on Undertaker. That was the infuriating part was on the rivals program, but A&E is back. And, and here's the thing. They can get better ratings on the A&E network talking about and doing shows on wrestlers from 20 and 30 years ago than they can now with an entire new wrestling program. It's, <laughs> this is the sad state of where we're at, but a&E has figured out from last year with the biography series and the most wanted treasures and other things that the wrestling fans are starved for some content that they would want to watch about wrestlers that they like. And so they got to go back 15, 20, 25 years or more. And they debuted the season premiere two hours on The Undertaker. And I mean, you know... <laughs> You're going to, we're going to talk about the, the fact that the WWE has, uh, sway over these productions. They're cooperating. They have, they're giving footage and they're giving stars for the talking heads and for the panels and things. But in return, obviously history must be rewritten. But I think if any, if any of the fans, the people, the cult of Cornette that listen to this program. Don't watch these shows to learn anything about wrestling history because that's why you listen to us. But for the video and the chance to hear these guys talk currently about retrospective on their career, the WWE production of the actual the show, they do a great job producing things, editing things, the, the comments, the video that they can find. They must have every minute of video of every show they've ever done minutely, you know, logged or elsewise they have people just pouring through it all the time because they can come up with a clip or a statement that matches what they want instantly. So they're well put together programs, except for the truthfulness and veracity sometimes. Bingo. But, um, but you know, with this, with undertaker, it just underscored to me, no pun intended no other human being on the face of the planet earth wrestler or otherwise could have could have been in that gimmick and it lasted 30 years would you agree with that brian last i would absolutely agree with that yes he looked the part even before he got the gimmick if if you as you look at this show you go this just this fell together vince Wanted to go all the way with it. There's been a few things in history he wanted to go all the way with because it was his idea and he loved it. Million Dollar Man, Undertaker. Um, you know, right now we're seeing it with Cody. Cody got the the uh, the treatment from the start. Will it last 30 years? We don't know. But at the same time, this could have been fucking death warmed over. This could have been a rotten gimmick on anybody else. But Mark Calloway figured out a way, and I think one, the one thing that Bruce Pritchard said that maybe actually was close to being true on the program, on any of these programs, was Mark was kind of an old soul anyway. And even though he was in his 20s, he had that, you know, that aura, and just, and he wasn't a, you know, a wild man bouncing off the walls in the locker room. He was mature and he realized what he had to do to, to get to where he wanted to go once he got in the business. And so anyway, I love the original, the story about Buzz Sawyer and, and Mark's original training. Um, That's not even the only person Buzz Sawyer did that to that became a wrestling star. Buzz Sawyer did that to Magnum TA. Yeah. And then Terry Allen chased him across the country to Oregon. Instead of ripping off everybody that wanted to learn to wrestle and taking their money and blowing town, if Buzz Sawyer had just asked for 10% of the guys that he promised he would train, he would have made more money. 
Magnum TA, The Undertaker, and a number of others that I've heard, you know, uh, smaller names, obviously. But Buzz was a real piece of shit. But finally, at least that got his taker's mind thinking and his foot in the door a bit. And then he meets Fritz. And you know what? I had never sat and looked at that before. But when he made that comment, Fritz von Erich sees him and says, book that kid in the sportatorium this week. He looks like David. At that point, he kind of looked like David, didn't he? He looked like a mix between David and Mike because his hair was a little more red. Yes, but tall and had the kind of Von Erich facial features. So that was, but then they put a mask on him (laughs) and made him Texas Red, which was the name that Red Bastine had used in Dallas, like what, 15 years previously. Can I stop you right there? Yeah. Obviously, he's a big guy. I mean, he still is, but you see him when he's young and he's getting some size and he's a big guy. But even with that said, how intimidating must it be to have your first match against Bruiser Brody? <laughs> in Dallas, in the Sportatorium, My on God. top of all that. Um, and, I, you know, looking in hindsight, obviously, when Fritz says, and I don't know who was booking then, um, but when Fritz says, use this guy, they probably figure, what the fuck? And Mark, at that time, he was barely out of his teens, and he had, you know, just kind of a plain look facially, so they probably figured, we'll since Percy Pringle, who that was a kick also that Percy managed Mark in his very first match and then later on came became Paul Bearer, they probably just figured, well, we'll give Brody some big guy to beat up, put a mask on him, call him Texas Red. That's a name that's been recognized, and the guy will have heat because Percy's his manager, and that continues that story. They had no idea they'd ever see this guy again, much less he'd be one of the biggest stars in wrestling. So that's why they did that. But boy, it had to be, you know, he had to be shitting uh, with Brody. But then South Africa through the Simpsons, I'd forgotten that he even went and worked in South Africa. Was that, was it there or Japan? He was Punisher Dice Morgan. That may have been Japan, but you know the other thing? Seeing Steve Simpson in this thing? In retrospect, he's not as skinny as I remember him being, considering a lot of the things we've seen in the last few years. I'm yeah, surprised no, by that. All the guys that in the 80s, people used, well, he's so small. How could he even make it? And now they're like giants. Um, but it 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 really came, started coming together when Mark went to Memphis, and they uh that was February or early 89. And I I got a kick of the clip of him working with Brian Lee on television because Brian, of course, was half brothers with Ron and Don Harris, and they were all friends with Mark. And at one time, all of them lived in Nashville. And that was an example of of uh, he beats Jerry Lawler for the unified world title in Memphis at that time, which was the USWA and world class and et cetera. AWA. AWA. Unofficially. Yeah. Unofficially. Lawler would bring guys in like that. And because he had 52 shows a year in every town. So he would bring guys in, put them with a manager. I think that was Ronnie P. Gossett that was managing Mark at that point. And he would put them over to let the people know that, oh my God, this guy is for real. And then they would separate and the guy would work through all the other baby faces on the card and beat them. And then Lawler would come back at the end and, you know, and win in the end. And that's the way he did with Kamala. Kamala came in and beat Lawler flat and then beat everybody else. Then Lawler came back, had the program with him and came out on top of that. And you would get three, four months out of that. They didn't go this long with Mark because the territory was down and he wasn't Kamala, but Lawler was a master at doing that because he could have some kind of match that made sense with anybody. He would just do whatever the other guy knew how to do. And that's why the pattern of a lot of Lawler's matches was the same, but they were always different because he was more doing the other guy's shit than he was his own. And then we get to the skyscrapers. And I appreciate Taker plugging me. I I can't believe he didn't mention Dutch's. He didn't mention Dutch mantel in this program or they i should say they probably edited it out but dutch deserves as much credit as i do because when sid got hurt we've told this story 
I was obviously watching Memphis TV, even though I wasn't there. And I knew they had this guy that was seven feet tall, the master of pain. So I called Dutch. And if Dutch had said, eh, I don't know about this guy, then that would have ended it there. But Dutch said, hey, he's green, but he's tall and he's a great kid and he wants to learn and he won't give you any trouble. Boom. That's what we need. And then Terry Funk came up with the name Mean Mark Callis because Mark Calloway, you know, didn't sound particularly uh, imposing. And the unfortunate thing was we had to tag him with Spivey because that was the team. And does Spivey look like death or what? He sounds like death, too. Good Lord. But that was the thing. is, And Spivey spent this whole, <laughs> this whole show complaining about how WCW disrespected them, didn't do anything with them. The skyscrapers yeah, were punctured positioned. his lung. Yes. Well, and the skyscrapers had been positioned as the top heel team, even though they were the shits. You couldn't have a fucking match with them. Because I've, ta- I've mentioned this before, Sid looked like a million dollars, right? He shouldn't sell. But Spivey was just a big fucking fleshy lump that never took bumps, had two left feet, couldn't fucking work. He was a badass, tough guy in real life, but he looked like a goddamn schmo, and he was trying to work stronger than Road Warrior Animal. So now you got two guys that won't sell anything, including the eyes, and they couldn't bump, and they couldn't do spots, and they couldn't feed, and they couldn't fucking get any heat because the people stood up and gave Sid a standing ovation every time he tagged in. Because he looked so great and he didn't know how to be a heel. Well, the other thing was, sometimes when Sid wasn't in the match, the fans would start chanting, we want Sid or tagging yes. Sid. <clears throat> Remember we did that watch along of the Great American Bash, that one or one pay-per-view. 89, yeah. yes. And the people, we want Sid whenever Spivey's in there. So the point is, Spivey used this as a chance to bitch. The deal was, we got a replacement skyscraper who was green and was tall and was a great kid. And then there's Spivey. And that was that that team had no appeal whatsoever compared to the appeal of Sid and Spivey, because at least people like Sid. So the consensus was amongst the booking committee of which I was there at the time that we get what we get out of the skyscrapers, but that we wanted to do something with mean Mark Callis long-term because he was young and a fucking good person, and you could see he had talent. But then Flair quit as Booker because of Heard, and then about a month later, I quit the booking committee, and Kevin Sullivan had been a fan of Mark's. That's why I believe he ended up being broken loose from the team and put as a single with Paul Lee as his manager to try to give him some, you know, somebody that could talk for him and some heat because Paul Lee was more already established. Yeah, they left out out a really big part of the story, you know, because they showed the part where Spivey talked about beating up the Road Warriors. But they left out the part where during the pay-per-view match, which was the street fight, Spivey no-showed. So he had Mike Enos under a mask. Yes. Teaming with Mean Mark, the new skyscraper. So no one gave a shit about this team. Against the road warriors. Well, and besides that, he acted like he said it, because Spivey, I guess, is delusional and thinks he was a badass in his younger days, but he wasn't going to fucking kick the shit out of Animal and Hawk both together unless they were selling for him. It was an angle. It was an angle. That's why they were laying there letting Spivey hit him with hit him with chairs. Now, did he hit them too hard? Probably. And was that one of the reasons why he no-showed the match where they were going to get their hands on him next? Probably. And he can claim it was, I was upset at WCW, so I just went back to Japan. Well, we didn't miss you. We really didn't. Do you remember, um, do you remember what Mean Mark Callis' finishing maneuver was when he became a single? Oh, goddamn, was it the heart punch? The heart punch. The heart punch. Um, Because he's not dropping elbows off the top rope at seven feet tall. But see, here's the thing. By that time that they made him a single and put him with Paul Lee and everything, and then the famous quote, Ole comes in. Heard puts Ole in charge of everything again. 
And Ole didn't see anything in him and didn't want to give him a raise and ran him off. And that's where Ole is the one who said, nobody's ever going to pay to see you wrestle. They wouldn't mention Ole. Did they mention Ole's name or did oh, they yeah. not? No, Mark, that, yeah. uh, the Undertaker Mark absolutely mentioned Ole Anderson's name. I couldn't remember whether Ole's name was banned on WWF approved programming or whatever. But anyway, so then obviously Paul E just calls Bruce Pritchard because Paul back then, before he'd even become a manager in the business, he was on the phone with everybody like he always has been trying to figure out some way to get something over on somebody. So Paulie said, okay, they don't want this kid. I'll call Bruce. And Bruce arranged the meeting with Vince. And <laughs> Mark told a story about Paul taking him out in New York, which is Paul's gimmick. He did the same thing for me, even though I didn't want to go. But uh, let's uh, happy. Heyman is the best talking head on any of these programs. He is fantastic. And whatever can be said about somebody to paint them in the best light or to tell the story uh, most succinctly and effectively, Paul can give you the quote. He's fucking amazing. And I would love to see him on all these programs. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, on the other side of the fence of Talking Heads, I know Bruce has to be Vince because Vince won't do these shows. And I know he has to speak for the company. But does he still have to act like that people gave a shit about brother love? This has been, he used it and it's, it's not a put on and I'm not even knocking Bruce. Now I am knocking brother love. Cause that was fucking bloody awful. But he used to, from the time I went up there 25 years ago, he would tell stories about how brother love did this and was over with that. And boy, we had a great match or we did this promo or what, when everybody mentions all, and I'm not doing this out of managerial jealousy, I promise you. And me and Bruce work together in other aspects, and that's just fine. But has anybody ever said that Brother Love was a great manager, or was Brother Love another thing that Vince did to make wrestling in the late 80s, early 90s look like a fucking clown show? In my opinion. Well, remember, Brother Love was barely a manager, only for a brief period of time with The Undertaker. That's what I'm saying. He had a talk show on Superstars every Saturday morning. And, but from that, Bruce said, well, he and The Undertaker were perfect because it was the yin and yang. You had Brother Love in white and The Undertaker in black. I get maybe Brother Love could have done the funeral service and The Undertaker could have prepped the body. I don't know what. But anyway, Bruce did love Brother Love. We got to say that. And he is awful in these things because he comes across as disingenuous. He looks like a slob. Let's not even, you know. Oh, no, now come on. Now, no, no, seriously. If you're going to be interviewed, shave your neck. Physical appearance. Shave your neck and button up your shirt. You're going to be interviewed on TV. He you can't slob. button a shirt unless it's custom made. Have you seen the size of that neck? Nevertheless, uh, on Undertaker's WWE debut, did you? he walked faster. I had say I couldn't I didn't remember that also. He was he hadn't got it down yet because that walking that slow out in front of a building of five, ten, fifteen thousand people is it counterintuitive, as they say, to what everybody else normally does. You know what though? It also helped once he had Paul Bearer in front of him, because that's yeah. set the pace. <laughs> it set the pace. Paul wasn't gonna fucking jog to the ring, I'll tell you that. I love Percy, but so so Brother Love chose to stay home and produce and work in the office, and they found Paul Bearer, luckily, to take up that slack. Wasn't uh, he fired right after that, actually? I think so. That didn't come out in the, in this piece. Okay. But yeah, I think that's when he went to Dallas. Or when, no, no, no. Well, was it right before or right afterwards? It was right right before. It was, no, it was right afterwards. Yeah. It, was, it, was well, after. it was, well, it was the cart before the horse. He got... This was right, but he was brother love with Undertaker right before he got fired. Yes. So then, suddenly, they jumped ahead from they found Paul Bearer, which was what? Somewhere in late 1992, to the creation of Cain. It's amazing they skipped right over the death and resurrection of the Undertaker. <laughs> well, I mean, they had a little footage there in some of the highlights, but they didn't dwell on the fact that, you know, he was gone for a while. And I am forever mortified. That's the only Undertaker match I ever didn't enjoy being involved in. 
Because I got to tell you, the entrance, everything that everybody said about The Undertaker's entrance was true. If you're standing in, and I've stood in major arenas in this fucking country, NBA arenas, 20,000 seat buildings, sold out, slab dab full, and you stand there and all of a sudden the lights go out and the people go, and the bong hits, bong, and they fucking blow, and then the lights go spinning around. When they had the lightning, that was cool. And here comes that music, the funeral dirge. And I've, st- I've got goosebumps on my arms and my legs now, sitting here in my office, thinking about it, because that was one of the most coolest wrestling moments was just Undertaker making that entrance and the people being so captivated by it. And then the match was made from that point. It was, I mean, a lot of guys have had great entrances where they dance or they sing or they do cartwheels or whatever the fuck, but this was the most minimalist entrance of a guy ever in wrestling, barely moving, barely no expression, slow music, and everybody was, tongues were hanging out because of the way he built that aura. And so that was that was amazing. As, you know, and the only one, as I said, that I ever didn't want to be involved in was that fucking, what was Survivor Series 93? No, Royal was Rumble it, 94. Royal Rumble 94 is what it was. Every heel on the card just comes out and jumps Undertaker and 13 of them beat him up and put him in the casket and close the lid to win the casket match. Including the great Kabuki and Tenru. Yes, <laughs> who just were on the show as guests and suddenly they're, oh, come out and help us kill the Undertaker. And then not only that, but then on the screen, he's seen as he floats up to heaven and I'll be back. And it was, that was too phony and too fake and too bullshit. And I just tried to hide behind the ring post. But in every other case, you wanted to be involved with Taker. And they didn't and, mention uh, that too much. And they didn't mention his return, the Undertaker versus Undertaker feud with his former friend, Brian Lee. Well, thank God they left that out. As a matter of fact, I think that Bruce, uh, Bruce, uh, Vince even laughed at it at the at the Hall of Fame, like even a fake Undertaker. But when they when they got to Kane, things really picked up because also part of the deal is they can't really talk about the first five years of the Undertaker streak in the WWF because remember it's Giant Gonzalez, Jimmy Snuka. They showed the, these highlights, but not at length, but those were some of the worst matches ever, and it wasn't Taker's fault. It was Vince was still booking The Undertaker as a giant for those first several years, and and that's the way he booked giants against other giants. And then Taker got to be a made man by the 96-97 period and the Attitude Era starting, and takers become more important and gotten over more he could be more of the the undertaker he wanted to be lose a little bit of the the makeup and bring more of himself into it and like he said on the show show that big guys can still be athletic and that's when you know he really started being able to perform and get away with it and had more quality opponents coming into the company because 92, 93, 94, 95, there, it was Yoko that could give Taker a good fight, but there was no Mankind, Mick Foley, there was no fucking, it wasn't the golden period of Undertaker yet, and that started with Kane. And they showed, I, I never even knew there was a camera in that studio when we were doing that, just me and Glenn in the ring, and now it's been on Twitter, it's been on a home video, and now they put it on A&E. Me teaching him how to do the Michael Myers sit-up. With, I, and it's... Some people may be wondering why that needs to be taught. Why isn't that something he could just pick up on? Why is it more well, difficult than people realize? And I was actually, I was going to say, it's kind of, I hate that they had the camera there when we were doing shit, because that's like showing the, the, you know, the magician revealing how he gets the rabbit out of his fucking hat or whatever. But... It, obviously, I didn't need to teach Glenn Jacobs how to do a sit-up 
But the Michael Myers setup that Undertaker was adopting is distinct for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it's best done spooky, like in the movies, if you don't move any other part of your body besides your waist. It's like your waist is on a hinge. And with the arms at the sides and the head in the same position, you just got to come up like your waist is on a hinge, and as soon as you get to the top of the sit-up, then you do the look to the left. And it's all in two motions. Up, look. Arms don't move. Feet don't come off the ground. If your feet come off the ground during the sit-up, it kind of makes it look more human and less supernatural. So that's all I was showing him. But, <laughs> you know, anyway, they had cameras running everywhere back then, I guess. And in that vein, why does everybody now, even the guys, have to say storyline instead of feud or rivalry or something that would sound less fake? Because it's pounded into their head. Um, and then Undertaker and Mankind. The, the best segment of this show, and they spent a lot of time on it, was the Hell in a Cell match. Going, I mean, it's been gone over a million times, going back and forth over it again, but still with the comments from the guys, and you see the footage, and and it, the also Undertaker having a bad ankle was, I'd forgotten about that. We were worried about that going into the match, and at the time, and nobody even know with all the other shit going on, but you see when Taker got crawled down through the top of the cell that had given way and dropped into the ring and landed on that bad ankle. He hops and limps one time and quits selling it. Never sold it again. <laughs> and that was a, a worry we had. And also the bump off the top of the cage and Mix talked about this. We didn't, I didn't know it was going to happen. I don't think anybody but Vince and maybe a, a Pat or Bruce, because he was on gorilla um, maybe they knew, but nobody had any idea what it was going to look like. And and I think that's the way guys passed shit by Vince a lot. You know, the, the click still says Vince approved the curtain call. I think a lot of times somebody will give Vince a the gist of something like, I think maybe if we're climbing up there, he can knock me off the side of the cage. Well, that doesn't sound like he'll hip toss me off the top of the cage, 25 feet through the announcer table, whatever. Sometimes people give Vince part of the information and he says, okay, and then they extrapolate, but nobody knew that that was going to look like that. And then the second bump through the cage, as we've talked about before, the, the cage was not supposed to break that clean away like that on that choke slam. And that's the one that knocked Mick out, and that's why Terry Funk had to ad lib, because everybody in the back at the monitor at Gorilla was like, "Fuck, is it over? He can't. What are we gonna do? We've got time. What's going on?" And Terry just—I don't remember anybody telling him to. He just was smart enough to go, "Well, I'll buy him some time." And you know, that's um. By the t a lot of people also have forgotten, and if we'd had any idea. And like I said, what was going to go on beforehand, this wouldn't even have been done. Cactus ran out in the match after the Hell in a Cell to interfere in the finish. Whose match was it? I can't even remember now. Title match. I don't remember. Rock or Austin, I would think. But that was the thing is when we put the show together, we knew the that the finish of Hell in a Cell, we knew who was going to win, but we didn't have any concept of the shape that Mick Foley was going to be in afterwards. And to the point where I've mentioned when he didn't remember doing the thumbtack spot, he asked me afterwards, did we do the tax? <clears throat> and they had pulled the tooth out of his nose and everything, but because that next match went in and nobody had time to process what the fuck had gone on, that the, that title match was still counting on Mick Foley or mankind interfering, running out. And I was trying to get them to to not do it because if, if for nothing else, just because of Mick's health, we weren't still sure whether or not that he was all right. 
And as well, it made it look, you know, kind of weak. If after all of that, the guy comes back out and runs in another match, but the match had already prepared and it was the live show was ongoing and they said, oh, OK, have him go do it. If he says he can do it, he can do it. But that was I was trying to talk about it. But no, you've done enough. They don't need to see you again tonight. But the team was in need. Anyway, um, and like I said, you know, they they talked about the streak and they showed the clips of the first several. Um, but it was the big thing that they talked about, and even Taker kind of, you know, they don't criticize Vince and his decisions much, but I think everybody here realized, no, that shouldn't have ended. Vince temporary insanity one day and decided to do it and it can't be undone but that never should have ended that was a massive fuck up but um but mark became the undertaker and the undertaker became mark and it became a kind of a, a combination of the two which is what every great wrestler and every great gimmick that has had longevity and success at a high level has to do and he did it in 30 years and here's another thing people say well flair this will be 50 years this year since he had his first match but he was and i'm not talking about his ability or what he could have done i'm talking about has anybody else ever avoided bad booking and heat with the office where they try to bury you or make you look bad or just periods of time where you didn't have a top spot over 30 years has anybody ever come in at a main event level never been diminished never been used as even a middle card guy and 30 years later with almost no defeats on in high level matches and the one that he did suffer everybody hated it and didn't want to see it happen yeah, it's nice to see everyone now admit that was wrong. Yeah. And they said so, in the thing, oh, he had to do it to get someone over, to get a young guy over, and then yeah, I, oh, so he did it with Brock. What? Yeah. No. So I'm I'm but I'm just wondering, has anybody ever equaled that in the wrestling business? At at, at that uh, think of a star that hot, that big, drawing that much money, and then spread it out over 30 years, and the only time he was never on top was when he was purposely, by choice, not actively wrestling because he was rehabbing injuries or just he, it wasn't needed. You only, you only needed The Undertaker when he's in the main event of a big show. And, I mean, you know, you can go Gorgeous George, you can go Thez. Thez spent time especially later in his career, just working preliminary matches in a lot of places and, and some lower paying territories because of his divorce divorces situation. I can't, I can't think of another guy, 30 years, main event, start main event, finish never diminished or booked badly. We can say the losing the streak was bad booking, but I'm talked about being made a, underneath guy change his name give him a goofy gimmick whatever the case he may be unique in in all of the history of wrestling i think so because it's two different things one is how many guys came into a territory for a number of years and never went below main event you know or even if he wasn't in the main event you never thought of him as mid card or anything like that a main event caliber wrestler the whole run and then the second thing is who had 30 years nobody it's the most remarkable run of all time and you on a territory level, Lawler is the only one I can think of that would fit on a territory level. He had, and he started in the in the territory because it was his home as a preliminary guy. Went away, came back in uh, ironically in '72, the same year as Flair started wrestling, and in 1972 was setting attendance records in Memphis and set more in '73, '74. And is still a name today, but there's no wrestling business to support him in Memphis. But he at at that at a territory level, Lawler had it. Who else had it in a territory? Bruno. No. He went away, came back, and never left the main event. 
Well, but at the same time, not for th- he he maybe debuted. For 30 years, no. For 30 years, no. Yeah, you- he debuted in Madison Square Garden in what, 1960. He was retired uh, in 19, or he retired in 1987. 19- well, that was second time. And so that's 26 years to the sec into the second retirement. So I'm not saying he wasn't over. It was I'm saying when the other thing is, you know, minus the American badass years, it's a gimmick. I mean, Lawler wasn't always the king. The early years he hadn't yeah. been the king yet. And really the king wasn't a gimmick as much as a nickname. Yes, he'd wear a crown or a robe or whatever, but the king is like the, you know, the nickname, the Undertaker, that was a gimmick. That was a persona that you had to get into. So I think I and I don't like the word character. So I will say again, I think this show proved, if we needed any, that Undertaker was the greatest gimmick in the history of the wrestling business. A lot of gimmicks got hot and then burned out quick because that's all they were was a gimmick. But Mark took this and made it a person and then got it over to the point where it was bulletproof. Minus a decision like ending the streak. Yeah. Or who he ended it to. Is this also the best example of the best of Vince McMahon's booking and the best of his creativity? Well, I I don't know because here's the, it's not an example of Vince McMahon's booking because he came up with an idea for a guy's gimmick and he wanted that pushed and he oversaw the push of it. But there were a lot of people, including Mark himself, that had input into the booking along those 30 years. And so it wasn't like Vince was just saying, I'll take care of Taker and you guys do everybody else. So it, the the direction was given by Vince as captain of the ship, but a lot of people were steering the wheel and stoking the furnace. It's so weird now because, you know, we've heard in documentaries and on podcasts and different things, everyone talk about everything. We never heard The Undertaker until, what, a couple of years ago? We never yeah. heard him at all. Yeah. And then we heard that Hall of Fame speech, which was the beginning of his spoken word career, it seems. I think he's doing another thing SummerSlam weekend. But it's weird now. Like, you talk about Hell in a Cell. We never heard The Undertaker's view on that. We never heard The Undertaker's view on any of these things. So, you know, a documentary, if it's good, is good. But with The Undertaker, it's especially interesting because we never heard his take. He kept, it's not even kept it a gimmick. He kept quiet. So you always had to assume what he was thinking. And when you actually start hearing him talk, And you're like, wow, this is a really smart guy. He understood what he was doing. And now we finally get to hear him. It's really cool. Well, and riddle me this, great one. How much does it have to do with the fact that this was a great gimmick that was over and stayed over? How much does it have to do with the fact that Mark knew how to do the gimmick? And part of it was an undertaker is not a man of many words. And every time that he knew that if people saw the under the man behind the undertaker, the human being, that it would diminish the aura, that it would hurt, that you could, because of his performance, you could lose yourself in that guy, maybe the undertaker that I'm watching in that ring that I'm seeing do that shit. That's going whatever. But, if you heard him sit down and talk like a human, you'd realize, oh, okay, but he's really human. Everybody knew he was human, but nobody could prove it. Nobody would heard it. Nobody saw it. <laughs> you could lose yourself in it. And that's uh, one of the big reasons why the gimmick worked is because Mark worked it. And Mark didn't put himself in positions where it would be exposed or the aura would be diminished or they'd poke a hole in it. And the fact that I'm calling him Mark now instead of Taker is actually something that even the boys didn't used to do. Now he's come out as Mark Calloway. But everybody called him Taker, especially in public in front of anybody. It was, he protected that thing. He put the work in to what he had to do to get what he needed out of it. And I wish, you know, that, a lot of guys these days that get good gimmicks that they could do something with if anybody believed them, 
And the furthest thing from what they're trying to do is make anybody believe them. I thought one of the coolest things in the documentary, now that we're past the point where we have to believe The Undertaker, was him and his mom. I, they would yeah. intercut <laughs> to that all throughout the documentary and an example of a mother who loves her son and wishes he had done anything else other than become a wrestler. Yeah. But it was really nice to see. I actually thought that was uh, really cool to see him discuss his career with his mom. And and all of the uh, production people from Connecticut, they had to give his mom subtitles because she got that Texas twang. She had to sign a Legends deal. Uh, that's true. And, and <laughs> autographed pictures of, of Mama Undertaker coming out soon. Mama Taker. Mama Taker. But uh, where are we going to take it from here, Brian? Well, Jim, why don't we think a little bit more about these scenes with The Undertaker and his mom at the kitchen table? Because I'm sure this scene has been happening for many, many years, since he was a small boy. And I would have to think many times a healthy breakfast was on the table as well. That's right, because a good old-fashioned Texas mother gonna get her kids started off to school or to work or to wherever to play basketball, whatever the case, with a healthy, good-tasting breakfast. And you know... In the old days, you had to eat the sugar and the carbs and the junk and the additives and all that stuff to get that good-tasting cereal that you love, but no more. You don't have to do that anymore, Brian. You know why? Because of our friends at Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has come up with the magic formula to have zero grams of sugar, but 13 to 14 grams of protein and only four or five net grams of carbs in each serving. Low-carb, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and only 140 calories a serving, but it's not taste-free, nor is it cost-free. You're going to have to pay for this shit, but it's worth it. I'm telling you, they have changed the game. The sugary cereals are no more. They have also spent time to perfect the crunchy texture that you like from your cereal. This stuff ain't soggy. Well, if you put milk on it, it's going to get there eventually, but eat it quickly. And they've developed an astounding variety of flavors that always hit the spot. Whether it be the spot in your stomach, the spot in the toilet, the G spot, whatever spot you got, they're going to hit it. The spot in your stomach they're talking about, this is food. Well, it, it, that's right, it's food. And it's food for thought that you'll be packed with protein. It's a great healthy snack. There's a flavor for everybody. You got the classics, the cocoa, the fruity, the frosted, the peanut butter. You can mix the cocoa and peanut butter, and boy, how do you know you're getting almost close to something that's trademarked there, but it tastes good. Or you got the cult favorites like blueberry muffin, maple waffle, honey nut, the indulgency, the indulgency of you with cookies and cream and cinnamon roll. Wait a minute. When did they stick cinnamon roll in there? How have I not heard about this? God damn it, I got to have some of that. Anyway. Go to magicspoon.com slash gym right now and grab a custom bundle of cereal. You can get whatever you want. They're not just going to send you something. You pick it. They'll send you some good stuff. And if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money. No questions asked. Of course, then later on, someone will come to your home and potentially vandalize your mailbox over this. But it's a small price to pay. And at least we know you're an asshole because you don't like the magic spoon. But you can get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal, as we said, at magicspoon.com slash gym. Use the code Jim. Save $5 off at checkout, off that custom bundle. And then enjoy the magic spoon. Take your magic spoon and stick it in the cereal and stick it right up your nose or in your mouth or however you eat your cereal. And it's going to be delicious. And nothing bad for you in here, except goodness. If goodness is bad for you, then, that, then the magic spoon is bad for you. But if goodness is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> 